Good afternoon, good evening, folks. It's back to World War II TV and Battles at Sea Week, and I am, in case you're wondering, in extraordinarily good mood because of the football. That's why the show's an hour later tonight than previous uh, normal nights, but England 2, Germany 0, that's it. I'm not going to mention it anymore, but I'm in a really good mood because of that. But anyway, Battles at Sea, we're taking you off to Iwo Jima tonight, and you may remember this show was postponed from the, the Iwo Jima week we had back in February, but I'm delighted that Mitch Weiss is joining me again tonight to tell this story because it was one that I, I really was looking forward to talking about. So good afternoon, Mitch. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Paul. How are you doing? I'm very, I'm extraordinarily well. So <laughs> we were just talking before going live. I have various people on my shows, the real pure military historians. I have sons of veterans. I have people doing their degrees in military history who are researching something. And yourself, you're more of the journalist. You're more of the writer. So um, when you're looking for a story, and you've you've written written several books, and you've got more coming up, what what are you looking for in a story, especially one set in a war setting? Well, I, I'm looking for characters, rich characters, people with that backstory, because I think you have to make these books interesting, and the way you do that is by weaving in obviously the technical stuff, the historical context but you need the people to help move the story forward and to carry it. And I think with Heart of Hell, uh, you know, I've, I've written 10 books now, and I think with Heart of Hell, one of the reasons it's, it's one of my favorites is that I was able to find enough information on the people, on the, uh, you know, the, 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 the sailors. And I was able to take you on this journey from the time they board the boat in, um, you know, summer of 1944, and it takes you through the Marianas campaign all the way up to Iwo Jima. And there's enough foreboding in there with the characters. One, I hope that you're interested in them. You want to see what happens to them. And you kind of know something bad's going to happen. And um, so you're reading it to see who lives, who doesn't live. But the reason you're interested is because of their backstories. And if you don't have the backstories, then you've written to a certain degree, a textbook. And I want to bring history to life. And that's why I write books, is I want to take that, the characters, the people, and tell their stories. And what's fascinating about Heart of Hell, I didn't write about generals. I didn't write about admirals. I wrote about average sailors, guys who, for the most part, were drafted. Even the um, leaders, uh, you know, the commanders, the officers, were guys who were drafted. Um, or they enlisted. So, for example, the um, the first commander of LCI 449 was a guy who was a lawyer back in Michigan, and he couldn't get in because of health reasons and he was older, and he did everything possible to enlist. And then he ends up on the um, LCI 449. But it's such a cross-section of America in this book and the war. You have people who were rich, poor, middle-class farmers, people from the city. Um, one of the heroes is the book of the book is an African-American man from Texas. So it's this cross-section of America at a pivotal point in the war and in the country's history. And I, I, I wanted to tell their stories. Yeah, and that's what's interesting about an LCI. And we'll get in, folks, to what an LCI is later on. Is it a big enough vessel to have a diverse set of characters but a small enough vessel for them to all know each other. You know, when you get into aircraft carriers, for example, you get entire groups of people who never have any contact with each other at all over months and months and months. And it and it retains the, almost that kind of class system and divisions of the below decks and above decks. And LCI, it, it's, it's got that kind of family essence about it that, that perhaps the bigger vessel doesn't have. And I think that's when... It's actually quite a while ago I read your book because I read it in February for the, for the Iwo Jima week. And it's that I like the fact it did take a while to get to the action because when I had, for example, Ian W. Tolon, who you probably used to research for your books, right. who's written his Pacific mm -hmm. trilogy, Great. it's just campaign after campaign after campaign, brilliantly written, but you don't get the time to invest in the people because there's so many, you know, it's a cast of millions. And that's what, you know, he's writing a very different sort of book for a very right. different sort of reason. But I like the fact that you get time to in get invest in these characters. As you say, there is this sense of foreboding. There's this sense that something's going to happen. And, and of course it does. So, Let's talk a little bit about the research process, because 
you know, you were the writer who brought a story that in a sense had already been discovered. I think we ought to pay a bit of respect to Dennis Blocker and tell people who he is. Right. Dennis, um, what happened was Dennis's grandfather committed suicide and his mother asked Dennis, can you find out what happened in the war that made your grandfather kill himself? Essentially, what happened was he went away to war. He was a young man. He was from um, Wisconsin. And when he came back, his wife said he was never the same. And um, after she passed away in 2001, uh, a little while later, he, um, you know, killed himself. He took a gun. He called the police. He had all his affairs in order. And so Dennis went on this journey. And this is before the days where you could really get on Google and the Internet and everything else. And so he only knew that his grandfather was in the Navy. Long story short is he managed to find out that his grandfather was on a ship called um, the LCI 449, which is Landing Craft Infantry 449. And um, he, he went and he did some research. In fact, it was fortuitous because they were actually having a reunion that year in San Antonio. And Dennis is from San Antonio. And he's walking down the street and he sees a guy with a cap, a baseball cap that says LCI 449. And he looks at him and goes, oh, you, did you know my grandfather? And they said, who was he? And he said, Dennis, you know, um, Clifford Lemke. And they shook their heads and they said, you know, bad things happened that day. And meaning on February 17th, 1945. And from that, you know, by chance meeting, he started researching LCI 449 and LCIs in general. He started talking to people who were in that squadron because there were 10 LCIs in this particular squadron and their jobs were to one to protect, um, you, you know, the underwater demolition teams who were the precursors to the Navy SEALs. And two, because they were redesigned, they could actually get close enough to the shoreline to, you know, return fire during invasions because they were retrofitted. They were regularly the big LCI, but they didn't have guns. And now when they became LCI, you know, um, with numb, they had the guns and they can do that because they were light and they were mobile and they could turn easily. So Dennis interviewed a whole bunch of guys, survivors, even people who weren't there that day. And out of the blue one day, he called me and he said, you know, he read some of my books and he wanted to know if I would be interested in telling the story. And so he had a, a little bit of a manuscript, maybe 50 pages, and he sent it to me and it was really technical and there weren't a lot of, there were, in fact, very few characters in there. And so I called him back. I said, look, tell me about it. Why is this interesting? And he started telling me about some of the people that he interviewed. And I said, well, that's a story. That's a story. That's a, and so from there, I said, you know, I will do the research on this. I'll dive in. I'll, I'll write it. I'll get the storyline and, um, you know, help me, help me write this book. Because all he wanted to do was write a book that honored his grandfather find out first he wanted to find out what his grandfather did and then have something published. So Dennis helped me, you know, with the research, but the storylines I started finding were just unbelievable. They were amazing. And um, that's, that's how the whole thing got started was Dennis Blocker. And, and it's Dennis interesting Blocker. that, that he admit, not admitted, I don't know that I know, don't know Dennis, but to share share his baby with a writer because we all know cases of people who are consummate professionals in terms of researching but maybe just don't know quite how to convey that story we've all been at places where we've been to lectures or conferences and there's someone who's got a story and for whatever reason they're not particularly good at presenting that story and it's the ability to then recognize that and then i mean i know he does do speaking engagements he does you know but it's sometimes you can have the best story in the world but it's not written very well and what you know in your case i've only written a couple read a couple of your books you know you're you're a good writer and that's that makes the difference because a well written book will reach a bigger audience than a not so good written book that does necessarily you know has all the facts in it but just doesn't have that oomph that takes it from being a factual record to a readable book but anyway we, we digress a bit but well, no, um, that's okay. well, well here's the thing with dennis and and i, I you know I, i've been in journalism 30 years i i think you know my background i have a pulitzer in investigative journalism and i, yeah. I I've, I've done a lot over my career and i'm still you know i work for the associated press on the national investigative team but one of the things I've done over the years is I've mentored people. 
So I showed Dennis the process and how we were going to do this. And, you know, the, you know, when you interview someone, you're not just asking, you know, your name, rank, serial number. You have to get the details. You have to get the background. You have to get the story and pull that out of people. And so I showed him how it was done with, with some of the interviews and getting some of the information. So I think that after he worked with me, at this point, Dennis could go back. And if he found something else, he would know how to do it. He would know how to write it and how to approach the subject matter. That's a really good point because, you know, it's something, you know, I've interviewed whatever it is, over several hundred World War II veterans. And if I could take back to my 20s the skills I've got now in my 50s and, and do it all again, I'd get much better results. But, you know, you live and learn. You learn the art, the art of chatting to people and, and pulling information out of them. As I've learned hosting this show, I look back at the earlier shows did a year and a half ago and I can't, you know, can't bear watching them. But now I feel I've got things a bit, a bit better under control now. But anyway... This, this, this story is amazing. So we've got some images. I actually made the PowerPoint tonight, folks, with, with Mitch's help. Yeah. So let's talk about LCI 449. It's original because they, they were originally conceived LCIs to transport infantry. And, and me as a Normandy historian, I think of LCIs as transporting huge numbers of infantry to the beaches of Anzio, Salerno, and Normandy. But of course, in the Pacific, we're talking about LCIG, which is a slightly different thing. These are these are, you said, they're, 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 they're gun, they're, they've got guns to provide fire support because of the needs of the Pacific campaign being different to the rest of the world. There's this need for these vessels that can get in close to beaches to provide extra additional firepower. And so, so I'll run through a little bit about LCI 449's history and, 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 and the, the crew uh, that, that, that originally, uh, well, crewed her. Right. As you mentioned, LCIs were, you know, most people think of LCIs as the craft that took people to the beaches in synchronized invasions. That's what's one of the great parts of this research was, was seeing just how synchron how everything had to be in sync for a massive invasion, whether it was, you know, Iwo Jima or Okinawa, um, where, where my father fought with his army unit during World War II. To get that first wave was amazing. You had guys on the beach who were called beach masters who were directing traffic, the LCIs coming in with the heavy equipment and the troops. It, it, it was just, I can't even imagine what it, what it was like. But LCIs, so that's what LCIs were originally used for. In about 1943, they, since, you know, we're fighting in, um, in the Pacific and we're island hopping, we needed a small boat that could actually get close enough to shore to protect troops landing in these invasions, okay? And also to help, as I mentioned earlier, the underwater demolition teams. Yeah. Because after Tarawa, um, and, and I, I think your listeners remember what that was, was when the Marines landed on the island of Tarawa and essentially what happened is they didn't know that the tide was, out, and, and all the conditions were wrong. And that contributed to the disaster um, during that invasion. So that's why the underwater demolition teams, which were created by Draper Kaufman and originally were in, in England and they were going to go over north, they end up, okay, in the Pacific because, you know, the United States is going to embark on the Marianas Island campaigns, which is Saipan and, and, and you know, Tinian. And um, so that's where, and Guam. So we're going to go over there. And so we need... Um, these boats to get close to shore to protect the underwater demolition teams that are going on the islands in advance of the invasion. So they can check the water tables, they can, you know, disable, you know, the mines and all the other obstacles that the Japanese had put up to slow us down as we were, you know, getting ready to invade the islands. So they, they serve those two purposes, really. Invasion, get close to the shore, you know, and, and with the firepower and also to protect the underwater demolition teams. Now, what happened was, they were retrofitted in 1943. So um, by retrofit, meaning that these boats, they were about 158 feet long. They had about 65 people on board. They had guns. They had guns, uh, the 40 mil 20 millimeter. And so now they had that firepower, the 50 millimeter, you know, uh, so you now had the firepower to get close to the shore and, you, you know, to, but the, the problem was, is that they were essentially tin cans. They, they were sitting ducks. I mean, you know, one hit and boom, it, it, it was over. Um, and so most of the people on LCI 
uh, 449 were part of a, a larger squadron of LCIs that actually made the journey from um, the East Coast. And then they stopped, you know, went through the, through the, um, the Panama Canal, stopped on the West Coast, and then headed to Pearl Harbor. So we pick up LCI 449 as they are getting ready for the Marianas Island campaign. That's where we introduce you to the characters. Um, the first um, commander, who was Willard Nash, who was from Michigan, he was that 31-year-old attorney who did everything possible to enlist because he didn't want to stay home. And then we follow his successor. Uh, Rufus Getting, who was from North Carolina, who would um, who was the first one during the Battle of Iwo Jima to you know be awarded the Medal of Honor, and so we introduce you to him and his crew and and his officers. There were five officers on board, and so you follow them on that journey from Pearl Harbor when they leave Pearl Harbor, all the way through Iwo Jima. And what's interesting is the foreboding. So when they're on Pearl Harbor. You know, they're in dry dock. They're getting ready to go out, you know, for the first campaign. Um, and, Mary, and like a few days before, there's this massive explosion in Pearl Harbor. One of the uh, boats blew up and, and there were hundreds of people that were dead and killed. And it almost was an ominous sign for some of them that, oh, my God, where are we going? You know, we haven't even left Pearl Harbor. And look what happened. And um, you again, you follow them and we pick. You know some of the characters, some of the people who have really interesting backstories, and so that's where you follow them from the very beginning, Pearl Harbor dry dock, over. In fact, it, the book starts with Clifford Lemke arriving in Pearl Harbor, because now he's got to find what you know ship he's on, and then he sees that it's the four four nine. And I think that the sense of foreboding is interesting because. The difference with the Pacific campaign to the European campaign is there's almost never any surprise. The Japanese know exactly where we're going to go next because there's a progression of iron. So it's going to what they maybe don't know is the exact date, but they know which order things are going to come up. So they have they they have they know what's coming. And of course, all the Americans are going to be involved in this know that sooner or later that's going to be their job. And if you're an LCI gunship, you know, as you said, you're going to be going in close. You know that you're very vulnerable, and so you've got that sense of, of terror. I know, I know, everybody has a sense of terror in a war. Every, whatever role you are, there's always danger. But there's something right. about that, knowing that you you are going in close, and that there's going to be losses, and the Japanese know you're coming, and you know you convey that very well. And um, and I think that photo there shows how what the size of the vessel, you know, as I said right. earlier, small enough to be a kind of family crew, but not so big. Everybody, you know, people, there are strangers, you know, you're, you're, you're with each other a lot and, you know, you get to know each other and the, and the they say the class issues kind of disappear a little bit in that kind of environment. And folks, when we get, we're going to go through the kind of the role and the story first and do some of the personal stories later in the show when we've got photos, we're going to go through the, the action sequences first, if you like. So, Let's get to February the 17th, 1945, and the invasion of Iwo Jima. So as you said, the, the role of the LCI gunships is to, to provide fire support to, to help bring in the underwater demolition teams. And also, generally, this is two days ahead of the actual invasion of the island. This is just preparation. So you, you've got to get your job done, knowing that actually the invasion is still 48 hours behind you. So it's a very high risk, very tense operation. So um, kind of run through what, what, what the roles would have been and, and, and how the crews would have been briefed for this. Well, they would have known, or they did know, you know, what their roles were in advance. In fact, the commanders of the LCIs went to a special meeting on one of the, um, on one of the uh, aircraft carriers. And they met with all the general, all the admirals and all the, uh, and all the um, you know, officials, and they got their roles. So essentially what they were going to do two days before, there were 10 LCIs and they were going to support the underwater and they each had a section of the beach. And so what they wanted to do was the, 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 the frogmen, the, 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 they weren't called Navy SEALs back then, but the yeah. underwater demolition team, they were going to swim to shore and they had their slates and they had their explosives. And what they were going to do is they were going to measure the depth along the beach to see where would be a good spot. To land. They did a lot of that reconnaissance work. They were really important. And the LCIs were going to stay at a given point, okay, because they didn't have to go in too close because the uh, underwater demolition teams either swam to shore, they had rubber boats that took them to shore, 
They were just going to stay out there and provide firepower. Now, what's interesting is you think of a reconnaissance mission as taking place at night. Well, most of the reconnaissance missions involving the underwater demolition teams took place during the day. So that was an extra added element of danger. And um, so as they are getting close, so on the morning of um, the 17th, they all know what they have to do. And so they're headed to their given area. And, you know, it's a, one boat had a section green and they all had colors. All the sections along the shore were colored. And so um, essentially what happened is they go on a single file and they go into their, you know, set positions and they watch the underwater demolition teams head to the shore. Well, here's what happened. Essentially, the, um, the, the Japanese, they saw them coming. And the order from their commander was, don't open fire. You know, this is, we, at that point, they wanted the Americans to come ashore. And once they were ashore, that's when the battle would start. And, but what happened was, they saw the boats coming, and they thought this was the invasion, invading force, and they opened fire with everything they had. And so now, from Mount Surabitch, they had, you have to remember, they had spent years digging in, okay, on these underground tunnels and caves, and they had the fire, the ammo, and they believed that this was the first wave of the invading force, and they opened fire. And um, two things happened. One is they gave away some of their positions, and, uh, you know, the commanders realized that, you know, maybe all that bombing we did to soften them up really didn't work. And so they knew that they had to go back and try to hit some of those positions with heavy, you know, firepower, okay, to knock out some or try to knock out some of the Japanese guns. But the second thing that happened was they started raining down, you know, mortars on, on these boats. And it was disaster. Um, we're talking about people, you know, direct hits, people dying, horrific. And so I use the LCI 449. As a, as to help represent the terror that went on during that battle, because they're not expecting that, okay? They're not expecting the Japanese to open fire. They, they think maybe something bad will happen, but it was their worst fears. And so now, um, you know, the LCI-449 gets hit by three shells, and it was a disaster. Most of the crew is disabled. They're dead, seriously wounded, and all of their officers are dead with the, or wounded with the exception of one. Leo Bedell, who's like this 22 year old, fresh faced lieutenant from you know Akron, Ohio. And he has to make a decision. What does he do? Does he stay in the line of fire? Or does he try to get his crew to one of the hospital boats, hospital ships that, that are there? What, and he decides he's gonna take control and he gets one of the other guys in there to pilot the boat because, you know, the, the pilot house was hit. So everyone, there was no one even to, you know, steer the boat, get it out of there. But they, but he gave the orders and they managed to do it. And they, they got them to a hospital boat and saved some lives. But, you know, we're talking about a lot of people dead from those hits and they were horrific. They just, some of them just disintegrated in front of people and you, the, the body parts were all over. And we get into that kind of detail in the book to show the horror that these guys went through, you know, during the, um, during the battle. I mean, your book reminded me a little bit of the Bedford boys by Alex Kershaw, because what you did is yeah. you looked at an engagement where there's lots of loss of life and lots of chaos and lots of carnage, but you focused on that one unit to make it make sense. You could have tried to tell all the stuff. I know, of course, you do reference LCI 441 as well. You can't, you don't exclusively right. stick with 449. But by focusing on that one ship, I think the reader then is able to follow that that story from, from beginning through to conclusion the same way Alex Kershaw did. Because tackling something like right. Omaha Beach or Iwo Jima in a broad sweep, you end up losing, it becomes a military study which is great, as opposed to a character-driven study, which is what you were trying to achieve. And I think that's the, the difference then. Folks, you know, if you thought we were going to try and explain all the different stories of all the different LCIs and all the support ships, we're not doing that tonight. That would take too long, and it would dilute the whole purpose of what we're trying to do. But, um, you know, by the, that it, it, it was just chaos. You know, and I think also it's interesting to point out, we don't, I think, 
we when we did Are You a Dreamer week, which of course you know you you missed, the recurring theme of that week is how much of a legacy the famous flag raising photo on Mount Suribachi has taken attention away from all the other Iwo Jima stories. And it's not that the flag raising wasn't significant, because of course it was, but that one iconic image has meant that every time people think of Iwo Jima, that's what they think of. And this story here that happened two days earlier, to some extent, falls by falls through the cracks because of that such famous story that's then you know made into two Clint Eastwood movies, one from each point of view. And so I think that's that's important to, to, to get across the idea that Iwo Jima is more than just one story. And, it, and was that something you were conscious of when you were writing the book? Oh, a- a- absolutely, because when you mention Iwo Jima, the first thing that, that comes to mind is Flags of, of a Father, you know, and the Clint Eastwood movies. Um, yeah, you know, the flag raising, I mean, it's so iconic. There's a statue in Washington, D.C. And it's, it's, it's important. I mean, what happened on Iwo Jima was brutal and it represented, you know, the kind of warfare we were engaged in in the Pacific. I mean, the Japanese and, and, and you know, we had that we had the island hopping strategy. But when we actually fought, we were going against a well-armed, fierce enemy. And, um, you know, with Iwo Jima, they had a lot of time to really, you know, fortify, you know, their positions. And so it was bloody and brutal. But there, there were other stories. In fact, um, you know, I mentioned Rufus getting earlier. He was the uh, first person in the in the battle to be awarded the Medal of Honor for for his role in um, making sure that the, the men on the ship were taken care of. I mean, he refused medical help. He was seriously injured when the third mortar hit the, hit the boat, and he refused help and um, said no. You know, because they only had one medic. And can you imagine one medic and you have dozens of people that are either dead or dying. Um, so it's, it, yes, the, the story there was just un, unbelievable. And um, I, I, I really believe too that, uh, you know, Leo Bedell, who, who was that, you know, young, you know, lieutenant, might have deserved the Medal of Honor as well for his role, because if it wasn't for him, it would have just been there and it would have sank. And I think, um, you, it, it would have been a worse tragedy for the. Um, well, well, let's elaborate on his story now. I've, I've put his image up on screen there. So, I mean, he, he's one of the kind of the star figures in the book there. So, you know, explain a bit more about what he did. Well, what, what Bedell wa- did was he was the last officer to join the crew. There were five or six officers, and he was the last one. He came on board um, before the Iwo Jima campaign. And uh, he was a guy who just was outgoing and he became best friends with um, Lieutenant um, Byron Yarbrough, who has a, a wonderful story about his, his relationship. He we'll, had. Do that. we'll do that one later, Mitch. But, yeah. but what happened with Bedell is everyone liked him. He was like, oh, he was outgoing and um, he was smart. He was, you know, an engineer. And um, so he gets on the um, boat and what happened is during this battle, Everyone around, all the officers, the guys who give the orders, were either dead or wounded. So he's the last man standing. Okay, Rufus Getting has passed out by now from his injuries. Um, the other officers are dead. So he has to make a decision. What do I do? And he didn't panic. He could have panicked. He could have. I mean, you think about it, all the people that are dying and the screams and they're taking the bodies to the, um, you know, to the area where they, they, they ate, the dining area. And he could have panicked and said, oh, but he was very calm. And he knew that he had to get somebody in the pilot house to steer this thing away from the battle, get them to a hospital ship. And he gave orders to everybody. Um, There there was a guy on the ship, his name was Frank Blow, who knew how to actually run the ship, operate. And he said, you come in here now. You're going to take over. You're going to do this. I'm going to go outside. So he gave the orders that, you know, decisive action that, you know, save lives. And you have to realize when they go into the pilot house, okay, and that's where the steering is and all the men, it's a, it's, it's something out of a horror movie. I mean, the guy who was actually in charge of the ship, you know, he was dead. His head was cut off. Others were in there. They were dying. So when they walk in, there's just blood and guts all over. And I, I often think of how I would have reacted under, under that situation. I don't know if I would be calm. And yet, 
this kid, and I call him a kid because, he's, again, he's only in his early 20s, and most of the crew members were 18, 19, 20 years old. He was so calm under, under that kind of pressure, and he knew exactly where he had to go and what he had to do, and he did it. And this is interesting because everybody who serves in World War II is trained for their job. So, but right. these men aren't trained for this type of horror to occur to them. Their job is to fire, you know, to, 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 to man the vessel, do their job, mm -hmm. steer it, stoke it, push it, fire the weapons. And now all hell has broken loose. And now you've got to react to a situation that isn't something you've trained for. They, they haven't trained for seeing ships around you burning, sinking, li li you know, listing, and all the amount of wounded they've got. Then, and say one medic per boat is, is, is woefully uh, un uh, you know, not enough for a situation like this. And, you know, and yeah, just, just hell on earth and heart of hell. It was such a, such a great title for the book, by the way. Um, so let's let's go back before we go into some of the personal stories. Let's go back to the immediate aftermath of the of the of the the tragedy of all these ships going off. Because these are some of the photos of the evacuation. Well, this is the famous one, I think, Mitch, that people see on the internet a lot. And this is four four nine. Then you can, I think, yeah. folks, look at just the the disarray and carnage and devastation of the of the deck there. You know, there's there's wounded dead there's the damage that i mean it, it, it that photo i think conveys a lot this is sometime after the immediate uh, you know, the horror that they're, they're standing around organizing things but i think that it does convey some of the some of the horror there and this is a list by the way folks of just all the 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 lcis that were hit that day you know, light damage light damage moderate damage um you know this this was a this was a, a storm that hit this fleet in a matter of seconds. And as, as some people have been watching this say, you know, it was, as you said there, that the Japanese defenders believed this was the full invasion. So they directed everything they had at this. And uh, hence why the result was so bad so quickly. Um, well, well, what was interesting too is after, um, after the battle, and, you know, the, the, the ships go back and they hold the burial at sea. But one of the things they had to do is they, they, they needed LCIs, so they were going to try to bring them to dry dock and fix them and get them back, you know, um, in, in combat, which they actually did with LCI 449. But when they go back and they rescue everybody, Leo Bedell leads, you know, a handful of guys from the crew to do cleanup. And cleanup is you pick up the body parts, you wash down the ship, the blood off the decks. And that's what he had to do. And it actually did go back into battle, but every time it rained, um, they said, you know, the, the, the people that stayed on the LCL, like we, every time it rained, blood would come down the bulkheads. So they really weren't able to, there was so much blood, they really weren't able to clean it up. And so I think about that haunted ship out there, you know, with the blood dripping every time, you know, down the bulkheads every time it rains. So wow. that gives, that gives I, I think, listeners kind of a, a visual picture of just how bad the damage was. And one of, a, one of the characters in the book, when we talked to his daughter, said that when he got drunk at night, he would talk about the chum, meaning that they had these buckets for, of chum with their three sort of, and how he had to pick up like pieces of body parts, brains, bones, put it in that chum, and it haunted him to the day he died. And the only way that he could get through the night was to drink. And it was it was different, that generation, because when they came back, you know, post-traumatic stress syndrome had not been recognized yet. It wouldn't be for, you know, decades. There was nobody there, you know, to talk to. And so they kept it all inside. And for some people, they self-medicated. Um, and a lot of the people, the survivors, when we talked to the families, they you know, became alcoholics or they died horrible deaths because they tried to put out of their mind what they saw that day. And it's interesting that comes up because there's already been people talking in the sidebar because last week we did Medics Week on World War II TV. So we did a show on mm -hmm. combat stress, PTSD. We did a show about the role of medics and how the self-medication subject came up. And, and also, I think we need to reference the fact that, of course, although not that we're going to go into what the actual invasion of Iwo Jima, we covered that in February, but to a certain extent, the tragedy of what happened to these LCIs was covered up at a greater level because you don't want the entire invasion fleet knowing 
the the first part of it's gone wrong because you're gonna you're gonna spread a negativity around a, an invasion fleet. So I, I expect the majority of the Marines who came ashore two days later had very little information about this because it was in their own interest not to be told too much. So do you, do you know what the result? You know, how, did they try and quash it a little bit at a higher level? The story. Well, well, what, what's interesting is when the Japanese opened fire, they exposed some of their positions. Yeah. So the admiral saw that. And they had to go back and recalculate what they did. They affected the, they knew that they only had two days to try to knock out some of those guns because the firepower was much stronger than they thought. Because you have to remember that in these campaigns, you would have these intense aerial bombings, right? To soften up the enemy. And they thought they had done enough with the aerial bombing that they weakened the Japanese position. But when they opened up on top of Mount Suribachi, they realized, oh, man, wait a second. You know, we, we didn't do as much damage as we thought because they didn't know to the extent that the Japanese had built these underground bunkers. OK, and that would later come back, obviously, two days later as the Marines were fighting for every inch of that ground. And it was. But at that point, um, they went back to the commander and said, look, we need to, you know, um, aim our guns, our heavy here here, here, right? Because they followed the trajectory of, of, you know, the mortars and everything else, boom. And that's, and that's what they did. So it actually did have a positive effect because they were able to take out some of the guns. But again, it, they were so firmly entrenched on that island. It was, well, yeah, they did keep it from, uh, you know, the because if you're a Marine and you know what they have, I mean, that just adds a little extra fear yeah. going in. Yeah. And we had a question from Tim Sampson. Did, did the UDTs actually complete their mission partially or completely, or did it get abandoned? Uh, what was the score there? Amazingly enough, they completed their mission. They they went there. They they got the dimensions. They um, ended up blowing up under underwater, you know, obstacles. So while the you know the terror, you know, the the mortars and stuff were raining down on the LCIs, a lot of the LCIs did not leave the line. They kept firing at the shore to protect the UDT. So their mission was successful. And in a weird way, they might have actually benefited from the attention focusing on the ships offshore, that the UDTs in a, in a strange way went in a little bit less danger. That, that weird way how battles work is that one person taking heavy fire means someone else is taking less fire, that weird kind of chess game thing that's going on there. But you know, that's yeah. that's you know, that's an interesting dynamic. And you can see there, folks, that for, this, is the, this is the full invasion two days later. But imagine those LCIs there, you know, just offshore there, directly under the fire of Mount Suribachi there, how awful that fire would be. But as, as Mitch said there, there were lessons learned that were then implemented two days later. So in the grand scheme of things, when we consider the Pacific campaign, that this... This is a small story. It's not a small story when you read your book, because as you say, when you're reading about men struggling to sleep, self-medicating, and in the case of Dennis's grandfather, suicide years later, it doesn't seem a small story at all. But in the grand scheme of things, like in, I say, the way Ian W. Toll writes about it, these are, these are minor kind of bumps along the road towards the victory, because the progression towards defeating the Japanese was 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 moving day by day by day. The Allies are only going to, there's, there's only going to be one winner of this war now. I mean, the, the, the Americans are going to beat the Japanese. It's just a matter of time. But I think these stories remind us that although there is this overwhelming firepower the Allies can draw on, and they do successfully, there are these tragic interludes along the way that need highlighting and reminding to people, I think. Well, and, 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 you know, you, we, we talked a little bit about foreboding earlier. And that was such an integral part of the book because it was really a journey. That's why we call, I called it the heart of hell. And in part, that was a phrase from a poem written years later by one of the survivors. He was from uh, Washington and he was overlooking the Pacific Ocean. And for his therapy, he started writing and he wrote a poem and there was a line, you know, in there that said, you know, we, we survived the heart of hell. But, you know, Iwo Jima itself, was this big, imposing, as smelly kind of hellish place because it smelled, it, it was an island filled with sulfur. So it smelled like rotten eggs. And here they are, there's a fog and they're headed towards this 
you know, island and everything they had, they met along the way was just from Pearl Harbor, where they have the explosion where hundreds are killed to Saipan, where they eventually take it. And you have families throwing themselves off cliffs. And for days, you know, the LCIs would watch these bodies just bob up in the water, men, women and children. And they tried to stop them from, you know, jumping. But the Japanese had instilled the fear that the Americans were the invaders and they were to come on shore and they were going to kill and rape the women. So they chose death instead of surrender. And so you're going along on this journey with these guys from Pearl Harbor to Saipan to, to and then they're coming up to Iwo Jima, this hellish island that smells like crap and, you know, it's foggy out and it's, you know, that was the final stop on their journey. Yeah, and it's yeah, and it's important to uh, we don't talk enough about the navy. I mean, the, the when it comes to Pacific, I'm kind of echoing what I said earlier. The Marines get all the credit in a, some ways, even the Army divisions. I mean, John McManus is coming on uh, next week talking about Bo the Boona campaign, 1942. You know, and mm -hmm. he writes a lot about the, the the Army divisions out there because you know that that photo. We're coming back to the famous photo that that ensured the Marines got their credit. Due, you know, they deserved it. They deserved that credit, but. I think it has meant that the army don't get enough recognition, the navy don't get enough recognition, and above all, the air force don't get enough recognition as well for that massive, right. huge, successful campaign. It seems that certain highlights kind of become what the public public are interested. But let's go back. Time to talk about some of the people again now. So there's some amazing portraits there. So uh, Bozarth and Blow. You talked about Blow there. So so Blow ends up taking over the uh, the wheel. Is that right? Yes, he ends up taking over the wheels and. Um... He's the one who turns the boat around and boom, gets them to, they have to find a hospital ship. And um, what's amazing is they keep going from place to place and every place they go, you know, they, they can't find the hospital ship. And so as they get closer to some of these ships, they have to have their signal man. The signal man is the guy on the top who has this, and that's how they communicate with each other. So one of the guys on the boat, his name was Arthur Lewis, was badly injured. And they had to get them up there to do signals because the other signal man was killed. And they're holding him up and his legs are literally falling off. And he's going to go up there and he does it. And they finally get to the hospital ship. And um, it, it, it was in part because of Blow. He, he was just relentless. And he's in there and his ankle, he's ankle deep in blood as he's doing it and body parts around him. But he kept his focus and he got him there. Uh, Bozart is interesting because he was a guy who was a devout Christian. He was from Oklahoma City. His father was, you know, a preacher, tight-knit family. And uh, he gets drafted and he, you know, he goes, he was thinking, you know, for a moment that maybe he would be a conscientious objector. And what I love about his story is he's such a sweet kid. And he's the one that everybody goes to on the boat because he knows the Bible inside out. So before battles, they would go and they would pray with him and he would say prayers with everyone. And he carried around a little pocket sized New Testament, which is wonderful. And so he goes, he ends up, you know, with the with the LCI 449 from the very beginning. And they stop in San Diego before they go to Pearl Harbor in 1944. And when he's there, he goes into a broom shop. I, I guess th they were stores back then where they sell brooms. And Bozart's father worked in a broom factory in Oklahoma City. So he goes in there and he meets this woman. And you have to understand, he didn't date. And for a week, they're inseparable. They have this affair where they're waking up in the morning along the beach. It's this beautiful romance. And then he goes off, you know, um, to the Marianas campaign. And he thinks he's going to come back and see her. He's writing letters to her. And um, I, I don't know if I want to give it away, but he ends up, you know, dying in the battle and they identify him, uh, you know, because one of the more cut his head off and they identified his body when they reached into his pocket and there was his Bible. His whole body was burned except for the New Testament that was in his, you know, shirt. So, um, and I did, I reached out and I actually found the girl, the woman, and she was in her nineties and I interviewed her for the story. And it was, he, she said, I waited. The letters just stopped. I waited and waited, and I never knew what happened to him. And wow. it's just, 
such a, a, a powerful story. Uh, you know, she went into details how, you know, she brought him home for dinner and they listened to the Vitroller in the, you know, living room. And um, it, it, it was an incredibly sad story. And well, I think it's interesting you said, you know, you don't always want to give away the story. But I mean, I'm thinking about the British author, Damien Lewis, who writes lots about the SAS. He's done, I think, three shows with me now. And on his first one, he was like, I don't ever want to give away the story. By the time he does the third show with me, he realizes that my viewers are a good lot. They'll go and buy the book anyway. All you do is you just whet their appetite for the full book. As I always say, you're getting the greatest hits, hits package tonight, folks, for the full story, for the album cuts. You've got to, you've yeah. got to buy the book as well for the full story. This is just... It's just the icing on the cake, we would say in England. There. So, I mean, and as someone said, that every one of these folks, they all look like movie stars. They all, they all look so, so stereotypically 1940s. They've got that attitude. But so we've got Holgate and Hoffman now. So two, 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 two incredible stories there as well. well. Well, Hoffman was a musician. He came from St. Louis, outgoing, loving family. Holgate came from an abusive house. His father beat him. Um, his parents were divorced. He was, you know, he he was a guy who was just totally abused. They meet up on the 449 and they become best friends. And they're bunk mates. And um, it reached the point where how, uh, Holgate wasn't getting any letters from home because, you know, no one was writing him. It's not his family, not his sister. And so Hoffman's mother adopted him. OK, by adopting him, she started sending him letter after letter after letter and said, you're a member of my family. I can't wait to meet you someday. You're going to come to St. Louis and it's going to be great. Boom and everything. And he would write back, you know, thank you, mom. And they had this wonderful relationship. And then um, in the battle, Hoffman's killed and um, Hoffman's mom keeps writing Holgate saying, what happened? Tell me what happened. And he didn't, Holgate didn't have the heart to write the mom back. And when after the war, he came back and he started drinking and he disappeared for like five years. No one knew where he was. He was drifting up and down the Pacific coast. And finally, he got clean and sober. He opened up a little radio store. And the biggest regret of his life was that he never fulfilled that promise. To, you know, Hoffman's mother who adopted him. So it's one of those tragic stories. Yeah. And he knew he was, his family knew he was dying of cancer. And so what they did was, um, you know, he got married, had kids and had a, had a good life with them. They knew he was dying. So they um, somehow took a trip to Iwo Jima. They, they got, they went to the Marianas Islands and rented a, an airplane and flew over it. And he said a prayer when he got off, he said a prayer you know, for, for Hoffman and for forgiveness. And um, he died shortly after that. Absolutely incredible. Well, there, there's but there. We've done, we've done his story of, of, of con keeping control and command when everyone else is, is, is um, yeah. lost. Um, there's a Herring, of course, so we talked about him. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Most decorate there, wearing the, 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 the decoration there. And there he's receiving it. And, you know, you can download his citation off the internet, folks. Just search, search his name and you can find the various bits and pieces about him. And it's interesting that given that this was something of a tragedy that at least the U.S. Navy did recognize the heroism in it because sometimes in a case where things go wrong, there, there's a tendency not to give medals. The military does like to give the medals for the victorious events rather than the kind of negative ones. But I suppose it, you know, with Pearl Harbor, there are also decorations as well. It's, it's important to recognize that bravery can come when things are going badly as well as when things are going well. Bravery is the same whether you're winning or losing effectively, isn't it? Right. Well, well, you also have to remember that the LCIs, even the ones that were disabled, they kept firing to protect yeah, the UPTs. Well. So they got the Navy con, con nation, you know, medal and everything else. So they did recognize the squadron. So this is our African-American. So um, tell me about him, because, I mean, that that's, again, that's that's the difference between an LCI is that you have got these people from different social strata in the same place that wouldn't be if they were in the army because the army was segregated. Yeah. But in an LCI like this, you do have people living in the same community, which is, is, is fantastic, really. Yeah, this is one of my favorite stories because um, Raphael Johnson was the only African-American on board. And the military was segregated, even the Navy. So in the Navy, um, 
you know, if, if you were African American, you were going to have a menial job. You were going to, you know, be kind of a steward. And long story short, is when he goes to base. He's from Texas, and he was a baseball player, great athlete. He goes to basic training. Even basic training was, was was segregated. You know, when you went to the Great Lakes Naval Center, you know, you had a section for African Americans, a section for for whites. He they recognized that this guy could fire a gun. He was really great. So what happened is when he was on the um, LCI, he went to the captain at the time and said, I'd like to fire a gun. Now, that was unheard of, okay, because most African-Americans, even in army units, they weren't on the front lines. They were they were put back in support roles like, you know, um, transport. But he on this boat, because you're right, they're small in the family. He said, I want to, you know, um, you know, run the um, 20 millimeter and not load it, but actually fire it. And um, they allowed him to do it because in practice, this guy was the best shot. His loader, one of the loaders for his 20 millimeter was a guy named uh, Junior Hollowell. Now, what's amazing is outside of the Navy, these two guys would not have been friends. Because Hollowell was from rural Oklahoma. Um, you know, he's a white guy. And, you, you know, Raphael Johnson is an African-American. So outside in America, they wouldn't have even talked to each other, okay? But here they became best friends. And during the battle, he, you know, Hollowell helped save, you know, Johnson's life. And the last time you saw Johnson was when he was being treated on the hospital boat. But it follows their journey from these two rural areas, this African-American spot, and how they became friends and their relationship. Um, and it, it didn't end well because Johnson came back he became, you know, an alcoholic. He died at a very young age. In fact, he went to a VA hospital outside of Dallas, Texas, and couldn't be admitted. It was like the late 60s, and he was having trouble getting in, and he actually died in his car. He had cancer. Can you believe it? I mean, he couldn't. they wow. wouldn't even let him in the hospital. And Hollowell was the one I mentioned earlier who, when he, he couldn't go to sleep at night because he would dream about picking up the body parts and putting them in the buckets, okay, and cleaning up the boat afterwards, you know, he, he's, again, self-medicated. But their story on the ship is the story of wonderful friendship. That blossom. And that's, that's the paradox in a situation like that, is that this friendship that was there in the war then can get lost after all. Because you know, it's, it's, been, it's in the news again right now, isn't it, about, about disadvantages and racism and what have you. And the fact is that, you know, we're going down a potential rabbit hole, but the GI Bill was much harder to get if you're African-American than it was if you're white. They're putting the statistics out there. The treatment you got in the VA was much harder if you were black um, and not just black, you, you, uh, Hispanic and, and other other minorities as well. And it's, it's weird that in some ways the US was so progressive in the middle of the war with these interactions on the vessels, but at the same time, part of a, of a, of a system that is, that is unfair at a high level. I mean, we're going, that's a potential rabbit hole to go down, but it's, it's fascinating in these books that pr the, the proof is there that there, there was cooperation among yeah. races and they did, they could lose all, all their previous prejudices. As you said, a lot of these guys would have been raised to be racist. That is how it was in the 1920s and 30s. I know a friend of mine who was in Omaha Beach, Harley Reynolds, who grew up in rural Virginia. You know, and he grew up where the white sharecroppers didn't like the black sharecroppers and vice versa. But his life was ended up sh saved on New Omaha Beach by a black medic. And that's it. He said, I lost my prejudice in a second. It literally drained away from me when a guy who was a different color was saving my mm -hmm. life. But you have to be in that situation where you confront those prejudices. And, and in these moments of high stress, like it, like off Iwo Jima, you realize that skin color doesn't matter when there's enemy shells raining down on you and, and crewmen are crewmen. And it, that's, that's the positivity that comes out of a story like yours is that in, in those moments of crisis, race doesn't matter at all. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah, amazing story. And then uh, this is, well, this is probably my favorite and I'm probably the, the last one we'll do. So you, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned him earlier. So a young Lieutenant, you know, again, most of the people in your books that are in their early twenties, if not their late teens. So this is, this is, this is, I think, my favorite story. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. So Lieutenant Byron Yarbrough came from a prominent family in Auburn, Alabama. His father was a doctor. Um, he had another brother who was a doctor. His mom died in an early age of some rare disease. Um, actually, it wasn't rare back in, it, back in the it, it, it turn of the last century. It was when you had too much corn in your diet. And so um, she died. Long story short is 
he's you know kind of a tall, quiet, lanky guy. Um, the first thing he does after Pearl Harbor, like many Americans, he enlists in the Navy. The dad was a little stunned because the dad fought in World War One and did not want his son to go in because he saw the hell that war is. But he didn't listen, so he goes in. He's commissioned as an officer. Um, on the LCI 449, everyone around him gets mail from, you know, women, you know, girlfriends, wives. Um, and he's a popular guy, but no, you know, he doesn't have a girlfriend. No, you know, his parents are writing and sisters are writing, but he really wants a girlfriend. So he asks his sister, hey, do you know anybody who could just be a pen pal? You know, kind of like online dating is now. And the sister goes, I know this woman who, um, yeah, she'll be willing to write him. And her name was Betty Jones. Betty was from a small town in Georgia, Cordell, Georgia. She was in her mid-20s. And back then, if you were in your mid-20s in the South and you're a woman and you're not married, you know, you're considered, you know, God, I even hate using this word, a spinster, right? It's something out of a Tennessee Williams play. And so she starts writing to Byron and, and he writes back. And you watch this relationship develop over eight months. The first couple of letters, it's, oh, you know, my name is Betty and I have my family and my dad's a pharmacist and he owns the, you know, drugstore in the middle of town. And Byron goes, well, you know, my dad's a doctor from Auburn, Alabama. And they start to, and you watch it progress. They start talking about their favorite movies, their, you know, their favorite songs. You know, he says, hey, you know, I just heard this record by Frank Sinatra. And it goes on and on and on until finally, before Iwo Jima, he writes her this letter saying, Betty, I want you to meet me at the train station when I come home. Because when I come home, I'm going to have a ring and I'm going to give it to you and we're going to get married. I love you. And Betty write, you know, his letters were fine. I mean, you know, and he would explain, but her letters were long and flowery. She was a wonderful writer. And, you know, she's, she sends these letters say, oh, Byron, of course I'll say yes. And she starts making plans and she talks about the weather and the flower and all this wonderful stuff. Except he doesn't write back all of a sudden in February. She's not getting any letters. And then he get she gets, you know, letters returned to send her. So all those wonderful letters she wrote saying, yes, I'll marry you. And they came back to her. And the reason was because he died. And the upshot is she never married. She was so depressed. She ends up going to Georgia, becomes a secretary, comes back home. She's drinking too much. And um, she died at a young age. But Tell us niece, about the pearls, Mitch. The pearls. Right. Oh, the pearls. Right. He, um, he um, has, you know, uh, pearls that, you know, he, want, he buys her, you know, oh, oh, you know gets in, in, the, um, in the Pacific. But the, the, the key, right, especially made for her. Uh, oh, I, I'm sorry. What happens is she goes down. The mom picks out the pearls at a jewelry store, okay? And they're waiting for her. And they, he has all the plans going that they're going to get married and stuff. And then, of course, he's killed. And at the, at the very end of the book, you see what happens is that she saved all these letters, she had them tied together in a bow in a box up in her attic. And when, when I was able to get those letters, I was able to put together, piece together that relationship and how it developed from, hi, my name is Betty. Hi, my name is, you know, Byron to, I love you. Go down and get the jewelry. My parents are going it, to, it's, it's one of the saddest. You could write a whole book just around their relationship. I believe their letters have been published now. I think you. I was on Amazon today. I was checking. Someone in the family has published the letters oh. completely in a volume. I think it came out in 2018 or something. So you can yeah. actually go and get the whole lot. Yeah. and But the story is just, it, it just breaks your heart. Just like the stories of, of so many of the sailors on the LCI, I, it, it, they stay with you. I know that when I was writing, I, I think I mentioned it to you earlier, Paul, but my father fought in the Pacific and he was with the army. He was a machine gunner and I could almost hear my father's voice and I could almost see all of these sailors and officers 
as I was writing and I would turn on, you know, music from that period and listen. And uh, there were times I was transported back to that time. I mean, I, I felt it because one of the things they did as a community is they would listen to radio broadcasts and they would also get things like the hit parade, but they couldn't get it live. So they would essentially the companies would put it on a disc and they send the disc to them and they play and they would sit out there on the decks and listen to the music look at the stars and and it made them forget about everything for just a little bit while they were out there yeah. it's amazing we did a show about swing music a few weeks ago mitch and one of the amazing things was this american the, the american military had this pro deal where they got the, the bands to record these kind of acetates that were sent out in their right. millions to ships and they kind of circumvented copyright law and licensing and royalties <laughs> to get music to GIs and Navy guys. And, yeah. and, and, and again, it was black and white musicians. The, the, the Army Records didn't care whether the music was made by a white label or it was just Army Records. And right. so it, we, we talked about that. We had some various swing, swing musicians on talking about how important these mm -hmm. records were to people on board the ship. And I think, you know, we're coming towards the end of the, of the evening now, but I think in some ways, the story of the loss of these LCIs in a in a book about the naval history of World War II, it's a paragraph. Essentially, it's that we lost these ships. Some were damaged. The lessons were learned that it helped improve the fire plan on Iwo Jima, and that's it. It's a paragraph. But actually, it's a story of people. It's a story of lives shattered, both those lost in the war and then those that survived the the girlfriends the parents the ones right. that came back and that's why i think i liken your book to the bedford boys it's that same story where the war setting it, it's it's a military book on the one hand but actually it's a book about people and it's yeah. a, it's, it's it's like a soap opera but i mean that in a, in a in a positive sense not a negative sense it is you're invested in their lives you want to know what's happening next and then when when you you have the some happy endings and some sad ending, which of course is what war does. War, the Allies were victorious, and we, we must never forget that. We must always be grateful that we did defeat the Japanese and the Nazis and what have you. But at the sense, the same time, millions of lives lost, millions of lives devastated, yeah. millions of people who came back who were unable to face the work, life without a drink in their hand and so on and so forth. So. I think that's why the difference between someone like yourself who writes personal stories and someone who writes military military histories. And I, as I said to you before we went live, I have both those types of guests on my shows and I enjoy talking to both of those people. And some people, some of my guests are both. Some of them are military historians who do tell stories. But to me, it's always about, about people. It's the only reason I keep reading is because I want to learn about people. There's only so much more battle information one can take in one's head without kind of it all just becoming overwhelming but people and people's stories is what 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 um draws myself and i think it's what draws the, the viewers and listeners in as well so what 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 next for you mitch what's your next project in terms of writing well i have a book that's coming out um september 7th and um i, I wrote it with um chris wallace the, the the fox news anchor we wrote one together last year called countdown 1945 which um looked at the months from when um, Truman takes over from FDR to when the atomic bomb is, is dropped. And it has a lot of characters, it's that narrative. And this one is called Countdown Bin Laden, which looks at the period from when the United States thinks he's in Abadadad to the actual raid. So uh, this book is called Countdown Bin Laden. And um, so hopefully, um, your readers will like that. It's a, it's it's again yeah, and, it's a good military like, narrative book. I'd love to come have you back on and talk about the the, the 1945 book as well because um oh, we talked about that in other in other regards and uh, and and Harry Truman we we haven't done a show on yet. We did leadership week back in June, so we thought about Patton and uh, Rommel and right. Montgomery, and I want to do one about MacArthur at some point because he's such an interesting figure and and Truman I think is someone that is just an un, unsung figure not not a hero i suppose but also just the burden that was placed on him in nine that's another subject of other day of course but yeah um in terms of tonight i think well we've had a, another great show and i think people several people have said they're going to go and buy that buy the book which is yeah. which is fantastic because it's it's what's really been pleasing to me folks is i was saying i was saying to people about a few weeks ago how my channel is mostly male viewers it was at a point at one point when 99.5 percent of my viewership was male 
it's still high, but it's it's dropped to 96%. So the 3.5 or 4% of women who are finding people like Laura Lies watching tonight, Angela, I'm so grateful that it's not becoming st stuck in that middle-aged white guys talking about World War II because there is a lot of middle-aged white guys talking about World War II, but it's important to me that other people bring in and discuss World War II because at the heart of your book is the fact that the war affects everybody, children, black people, white people, everyone's affected by it. And World War II should be of interest to everybody, not just the military buffs. And I think someone like your books will be will appeal to a wider audience than some of the more specific military books. And that's that's only a good thing. I think it's um it's great. So anyway, have you enjoyed being, being on the show, Mitch? Oh, I loved it. Are you kidding? I could talk, you know, some of these, I, I mean, we just, scratched the surface with some of these characters. Uh, and I don't like to say character, but some of the people, some of the main people in there. Um, I, I, I loved it. I loved it. And for the women viewers, I mean, you know, there's romance, there's love and everything in there. It's, it's, um, it's, a, I think it's a good book. Yeah, it's, I mean, you, you must have, when you were originally contacted by Dennis those years ago, you must have, when you first read it, you thought there's, you must have recognized there's definitely something here and okay it needs some it needs some more work it needs some honing it needs some more interviews it needs to find that narrative yeah. style behind it but you know you it's i can only imagine how wonderful it is when you discover those stories and i've talked to other people like damien lewis and john mcmanus and others and they when alex kershaw is another one a good friend of mine when he found the story of the liberator and things like that you, you know you've got a kind of yeah. a bestseller on your hand because it's just all matter now of it's not that the story tells itself because that's uh, that's that's belittling the writing process which as we talked about you can you can do a bad book if you don't write well but in some cases the story is so good it's yours to throw away if you can't make this into a good book you kind of shouldn't be writing really if it, a story of this of this brilliance you know it's it, it's it, yeah. it's fantastic so anyway i'm going to remind folks what we got coming up next uh in the next couple of days and i'll come back and say goodbye in a second so folks tomorrow night we've got john mckay on talking about his latest book surviving the arctic convoy so that is the we're going from the the, the tropics of the pacific to the the horror of mamansk and the convoys out there in the in the north atlantic that's tomorrow then thursday we've got uh, P convoy PQ 17, 17. So we're talking again about the Arctic convoys. And Friday, Ian Ballantyne is coming on to talk about the loss of the Bismarck. He's written a trilogy of books about the Bismarck. And Ian, rather like Mitch, although he talks about the naval history, a lot of people driven, a lot of character driven stories as well. So that'd be a good one to sum up that week there. I'm still working on lots more shows for July and August. It's just, they're coming all the time. But right now, it remains for me to say thank you very much to Mitch for joining us. And links thank to you. the book are in the description below. You can find Mitch on Twitter. You can find he writes for AP. He's well-known, award-winning journalist. You can find out a lot more about Mitch. But right now, thank everybody for watching. Don't forget, check us out on Patreon. Check out our social media pages. And um, we will see you all tomorrow. So thank you very much, Mitch. Thank you very much thank for you. viewing. This is Paul Woodhead for World War II TV. Wishing you all a good evening. And go England in the quarterfinals on Saturday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cheers, everybody. See you later. Thank you.